from Melissa Hayslip. Melissa, where you at, Melissa? Come on in. Come on down. We got to go. We got We're going to have a quick Q&A with Melissa Hayslip. Melissa Hayslip, everyone. Melissa Hayslip. Joining her on the stage. Joining her on the stage. Let Mr. Leonard Joseph from Houston, an acclaimed uh, documentarian, Mr. Stanley Nelson. Please give him a hand. Give him all a round of applause, please. <laughs> so we're, we're a little pressed for time. Please bear with us. We're going to have a quick Q&A. And uh, have at it, guys. Go ahead. Am I asking a question? Um, uh, so we're going to ask a, a couple quick questions uh, to Melissa, I, I think. Um, you know, it, it's such an incredible film, and, I, and you know, I know some of the journey you went on. Um, um, I want to talk about, you know, how you struggle to evoke that time, because that's one of the things that this film does best, is it evokes a time um, that, that for some of us, uh, some people never knew it, and so for so many other people, it's been forgotten. So talk about the struggle to evoke that time. That was a really difficult question. Okay. Evoking the time was really important, not just because of the emotion and the struggle and the beauty and the emerging freedom and freedom of expression, but also the change that was happening, the, tum the tumultuous time of America, and also the change that was happening in television, that we were starting to not only empower ourselves, but empower ourselves to think differently about ourselves and to create a new image for ourselves. And then the idea of what was happening in television, trying to create that telegenic quality in the films so to take us back to what that looked like and what that felt like. And so it was important to contextualize the story with the images of that time. And the music was key to that. Uh, when did you know that, that this was a film that you not only wanted to make, but you kind of had to make? It was coming up on the 50th anniversary, which is next month, September 1968 to 2018, is 50 years. And so I realized how close we were getting. I realized it really was important. It was time for us to tell our own stories, and there was an issue around people taking stories but not telling them and the issue and the importance of telling our own stories. We are finally starting to be heard and the idea of empowering a black man, a black story, a universal story, an LGBT story, there were so many issues and strong points that needed to be addressed today. It's amazing when you work on a project that you find yourself in it. And that's what this work has done, I know for me personally, is you find yourself in your people, in your struggle, but most importantly in your triumph, in the melodies of this, of this incredible film. And I'm just absolutely grateful to be a part of it. Uh, I, I I, I don't, I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, Melissa, but I, I know that you know, getting all that footage from Seoul was a struggle. It wasn't easy, and that you know, in some ways is the backbone and the heart of the film. Talk about you know, this, you, how long did it take to make the film? 10 years. Okay, so, so this 10-year this struggle, I know we had a lot of conversations about you know, how, to, how to get this footage. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, t uh, also Stanley is our mentor, and we went through his program, the Firelight Media Doc Lab. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> and uh, when we first showed uh, him the, some of the sequences, it was 2010, and said, what do you think? And Stanley said, well, it's a great story, it's an important story, but it's gonna be tough to make this film. And as we discovered, the issues around licensing, around clearances, around ownership, were not just personal and emotional, but were financial. <laughs> And so we had to overcome these because we saw the images that we wanted and we had to really put together a lot of lost images too because the, many of the episodes were, were lost, had been taped over, had been destroyed, 
or had just suddenly disappeared. So we, for 10 years, we researched every absolute possible choice and location for archival footage and the soul footage in unusual places sometimes. Um, what, what is next uh, for this wonderful film? What, what, what's going on with, with this film right now? Well, we're so excited to be here, especially thanks. Big shout out to Stephanie and Floyd Rance for having us. So grateful for the work they're doing to uh, support African American artists, emerging artists, filmmakers such as myself, and that they supported this film five years ago when it was just a 20 minute work in progress. Thank you so much. It's a full circle moment for us. What's next is uh, we're going to go to some more festivals. And uh, we were just at Black Star last week in Philly. Philly in the house. <laughs> uh, a we great were, festival. Yes, Black Star Film Festival. Also, we were in Durban, in the Durban International Film Festival in South Africa last week. And we were also in Woods Hole last week. Uh, so we've been very busy. We opened at Tribeca and we went to DC. Next, we're doing some more festivals and we hope that while we're doing festivals, we can get a distribu distribution deal and that will allow us to bring it to the people, both on public television and also theatrically so you can see it in a real theater. And of course, educational is really important too. Great. Um, I, I think it's important that we get this film to as uh, wide of audience as we possibly can because you know despite well not despite added to the fact that it's a very educational film it's, it's just so entertaining and, and it's just such a wonderful film. I think that one of the things that comes through to me you know is I've done a number of historical films myself is that you know we as African Americans tend to think that history is this constant upward movement you know like you know we started out here and we're, we're, it's a constant upward movement but what we see in this film this was in some ways the height uh, of, of uh, political activism and, and so much in, in the African American community. And I'm hoping that, that this is uh, something that, that happens again. So talk about that, because how did you feel making the film? Because you see it and, and what's happening on Soul is so progressive. You know, there's nothing like that on TV now. There's nothing like that. Talk about that. But at the same time, you, you realize that we need a show like this now. Yeah. We need it so much. We need a, a, a platform for black excellence, you know? And Ellis was an Afrofuturist. He was way ahead of his time. He saw us in better places, in greater quantities, with more freedom. And so I think what we're doing now in the world and trying to establish ourselves with black love, black pride, black power, uh, gender parity, uh, you know, everything that we're doing to empower ourselves is really key. And those themes are very similar to what was happening 50 years ago, not to mention the administration and the things that were happening politically. So I think all of these things should help us remember that we have to keep pushing forward. And what Ellis was doing then is what he would be doing now. I think he would be, you know, crazy on social media and he would be the same activist as he was then especially for uh, LGBT rights and for all black people and emerging people. And I think that that's important to recognize. Um, this is a question that, that I myself hate, but I'm gonna ask you this uh -oh. any, anyway. Uh, it's not a hard question, but I, I just hate it. But it, it's, it's, it's a, you know, what are you personally gonna do next? You know, what, what's the next step for you? I mean, you've, you've proven your chops. You know, there's a great, you, you're a great filmmaker. There's a great film. We wanna hear more of your voice. What are you doing next? Well, I'm very excited. I'm working on a couple of projects. Uh, but one thing that this has opened up for me is the possibility of pitching a new version of Soul. Yeah. Did you watch that? Yeah. And not, real, not to capitalize or you know, to step on any coattails or ride any coattails, but just realizing, seeing this content and how important it is, how important it is to tell our stories now, how, how much our stories matter now. I think that we need a space to explore these stories and to explore new artists and to explore our activism and our truth. And I would love to see a new version of Soul. And, and, and in, I think that that could really take off. And so I'm exploring that and I'm, I'm pitching the ideas to several networks as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at, at yeah. I, I think one of the things that we see at the end of the film 
you know, is, is how um, a network like PBS is blown by the wind of whoever is in office. And that's something we don't think about a lot, you know, that, 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 that this is really part of whoever is in power and things change. So uh, talk a little bit about that because I, I think that's really important for us to understand and also the fact that if we raise our voices, we can also make change. Absolutely, and you know, our nemesis in the film is Nixon, obviously. And uh, I, I'm getting the wrap it up signal, so, oh. <laughs> they just want me to, they want you to stay, they want me to leave. Oh, no. Well, we're gonna, are we gonna take no, some joking. questions as well, maybe? Yeah, okay, so just to answer your question, I think it's very important to recognize our, how we situate ourselves in this political movement, that we do have agency now more than we did, and that it's really important, whether it's immigration issues, whether it's uh, Me Too, uh, you know, there are things that we can do to push back, not only against the establishment, but about against the status quo and how people perceive us. And I think that's what's really important about Soul was that he was challenging the perception of African American culture. And in that way, he was changing it. And so I think we have that inherent power to push against the administration and to resist. Great. Um, do we have, we have time for like one or two questions? Are there any burning desires here? Yeah, go ahead. Well, we would love to come to Atlanta, and of course, uh, we are working very hard to get into a film festival in Atlanta, but we are, would love to come. So if you have any educational opportunities or screenings or connections for me, let's talk outside afterward. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take, take one more question. Anybody have a burn desire? If not, we're gonna... He was very involved in the new, the elevation of the culture. You know, it was all about the culture for Ellis. So he continued to do what he was doing on Seoul and bringing it to the next level. So for example, he worked at the Schomburg, at the Schomburg Center for the Research in Black Culture, which is the, uh, the Harlem Library extension of the New York Public Library. And he brought to it all of the elements of Seoul to sort of make it a cultural mecca before they had changed the footprint and he also worked with a lot of organizations. He was a producer. He was on many establishing boards, the board of Alvin Ailey, the board of Scribe Video Center in Philly. He just con con continued to push the, the, the needle forward. And he worked with a lot of great artists. He, uh, he produced Michael Jackson's 20th birthday at Studio 54. But he also just really believed that, uh, you know, the movement was not ending, and it was, certainly wasn't ending with Seoul. So he continued to push boundaries and lift the culture. Okay, uh, I think they've got another screening coming in. I just want to thank everybody here for coming, and I just want to thank you, Melissa, for this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful film. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.